So in this final lecture on cities, I want to talk about urban poverty and some of the challenges of urban poverty. Um, we kind of can't think about cities without thinking about poverty and some of the dynamics of poverty and the consequences of poverty. So um, uh, cities are settings for some of the greatest extremes in modern life. Um, and by that, I mean, um, and we as scholars mean the greatest degree of wealth and often the most severe poverty. So cities are places of tremendous inequality. The area that I live in, in New York, um, is phenomenally unequal. So um, I sometimes say to my students at Columbia University, you should know that you live in one of the most unequal states in the United States. New York is one of the most unequal states. In one of the most unequal cities in the United States. New York is actually the most unequal city of the largest 25 cities in the United States. In the most unequal borough. So there are five boroughs of New York, Staten Island, which sometimes we count, sometimes we don't, um, uh, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan. Manhattan being the central island of, um, of, of New York in one of its boroughs. Manhattan is the most unequal of the boroughs of New York City. And then the neighborhood around Columbia University is the most unequal neighborhood in all of Manhattan. So, you know, I live basically in one of the most unequal states, unequal cities, unequal boroughs or regions in that city and unequal neighborhoods. One of the most unequal places um, in the in in the United States is where where I live, and part of that is because there are lots of rich people around. So remember um, um, or listen to some of the lectures on inequality. Inequality has been largely driven by rich people getting richer. And so one of the ways to have a lot of inequality is to have a lot of rich people around. So rural areas tend not to be super unequal. They are just poor. Lots of people in rural areas are poorer, but they're not terribly unequal. New York is profoundly unequal, in part because we have huge, huge numbers of rich people. There's lots of lots of rich people, and our rich people are very rich. And so that means that there's a lot of inequality. But there are also a lot of poor people in New York City. Um, during the Great Recession, um, um, period 2008, 2009, 2010, um, you know, people began to be much more aware of the fact that about one in 50 people in the Bronx report no income. Um, so, you know, this is 2% of the population of the Bronx, um, which is a lot of people. 2% um, may seem small, but if you realize that there are 2 million people living in an area, 2% of them is a lot and they report no income. Now, this doesn't mean that they're totally, you know, um, 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 dying on the street from starvation. Um, there are a range of social programs that help, um, many of them work in the informal economy, but make no, no mistake, they are profoundly poor, profoundly poor. And in cities, we have often huge concentrations of we see this much more dramatically outside of the context of the United States. So if you look at slums in India or in China or in Brazil, you'll see these massive slum-like areas where people are extremely, extremely poor. And so one of the critical challenges for um, urban life is the challenge of urban poverty, is the challenge of uh, poverty, um, which goes beyond just an experience of being poor, but being poor in a city. And so one of the things that we'll think about is how the experience of poverty is in part conditional on the context of that poverty. That to be poor in some areas is different than to be poor in other areas because of what the area does in terms of either providing opportunities to transcend that poverty or providing a kind of stickiness, a difficulty or challenge in exiting that poverty. So the challenge of urban poverty um, in the United States um, uh, is 
uh, a challenge of the rise of urban poverty. So the number of Americans living in extremely poor neighborhoods rose from 4 million in 1970 to 14 million in 2013. Um, and this phenomenon is particularly important because of what we call concentrated poverty. And this is something very important for you to know, that it is a different experience to be poor than it is to be poor in a concentrated neighborhood of poverty. I'm gonna say that again because it's, it's profoundly important. The experience of being poor is an experience that you can have. And you know, if you're poor in a rural region, you're poor in an urban region, you're poor in a suburban region, you're poor. And that that has sort of what we would think of as an independent effect. It, it influences your life. But the context of the poverty really matters. So if you live in a context of concentrated poverty, it has profound effects on you beyond the experience of just being poor. So the reason this slide says is it exists is to make you realize that 14 million people aren't just poor in cities, they live in extremely poor neighborhoods. Now, and I'll just note that living in extremely poor neighborhoods and urban places is highly racialized. So it's not just that you're poor, that, that people, more people live in extremely poor neighborhoods, it's that Black Americans are disproportionately likely to live in these neighborhoods. And I've used this phrase before about how um, certain kinds of neighborhoods or contexts can be sticky. They can be harder to exit. And the concentrated poverty or extremely poor neighborhoods make it much more difficult for poor people to exit the conditions of poverty. So I'm going to say that again because I think it's so important. Concentrated neighborhoods, neighborhoods of concentrated poverty um, are extremely important for us to study in part because the same poor person who lives in a neighborhood of concentrated poverty or a neighborhood of not concentrated poverty that same poor person is far less likely to be able to ex exit this, the conditions of poverty if they are surrounded by other poor people, if they live in concentrated poverty. Now, part of this is because high poverty neighborhoods that experience a range of social program, uh, problems, homelessness, violence, joblessness, um, that we often think of as urban problems. But it's also that if you think about like, how do you get out of poverty? How is it that you could exit the conditions of poverty? You know, the answer is um, both very simple, but also very difficult to achieve. And that answer is that you, the capacity to exit poverty requires getting a job. Um, but there are neighborhoods in New York City where the joblessness rate is 90%. So 90% of the people are unemployed. Now, one of the things that we know about getting a job is that to get a job, you typically need to know somebody, or it's highly, you don't typically need to, it's highly advantageous to know someone in a job in order to get a job. If you're surrounded by a group of people who don't have jobs, it's much harder for you to get a job because you don't have access to the same kinds of opportunities that they do. And so here you begin to see how the context of poverty influences the experience of that poverty. And one of the most important contexts of poverty is this experience of concentrated disadvantage. If we think about the range of resources that might create opportunities, we've talked about many of them across these lectures. We've talked about cultural capital, social capital, economic capital, symbolic capital these different kinds of resources that may help for people to take advantage of or even acquire opportunities, you realize that if you live in a neighborhood of concentrated disadvantages, there are just fewer and fewer and fewer of those resources available to you. There's few, little economic capital, the, there's li limited sets of cultural resources available, there are limited sets of social resources available to you, and in general, it therefore means that it's much, much, much more difficult to experience mobility or to transform the conditions of your poverty. This comes with 
this critical insight about concentrated disadvantage and how concentrated disadvantage has an independent effect on poor people. So that poor people who live in contexts of concentrated disadvantage are worse off than poor people who do not. So if you have the same amount of money, you definitely don't want to live in a neighborhood of concentrated disadvantage if you're hoping to be mobile, because that neighborhood will have a negative independent effect on you. So um, we see the uh, importance of social context. This is also something that's potentially modifiable we may be able to design different kinds of urban spaces or communities where we seek to undermine concentrated disadvantage. Rich people and middle-class people tend to have an attitude of not in my backyard. They tend not to want poor people around them. They tend to try and create exclusion of poor people from the neighborhoods that they live in. But a consequence of this is creating conditions of concentrated disadvantage and potentially generating more and more of the social problems that we associate with urban social problems like homelessness, violence, and joblessness. And so, you know, one of the questions becomes, how is it that we can engage in middle-class and wealthier communities to help them understand that through processes of social exclusion, one of the things that they're doing is producing systematic, continued poverty in the cities within which we live. A related issue of concentrated disadvantage is racial segregation. Now, racial segregation um, arose because of active and explicit discrimination um, uh, and because of the widespread, um, uh, what we call the white flight or migration of whites into the suburbs. Um, and uh, it's fallen since the 1980s, but not that um, uh, uniquely, not that dramatically. Um, and so in this chart, and I know it's a little bit small, a little bit bigger, hopefully this will show up for you all. You can see um, uh, the black-white segregation um, in 1980. Um, and, uh, uh, um, this black-white segregation is a score from 1 to 100, or 0 to 100, excuse me. Um, uh, and 100 meanings, means um, absolute segregation. Um, and uh, what you'll know is that in cities like Chicago, which is highly segregated, um, you know, the black-white segregation was 90.6 in 1980, and in 2010, it's 82.5. It's declined, but not that much. Um, and overwhelmingly, um, uh, uh, the segregation is something that has been um, sustained in the United States. And you should note that between 2000 and 2010, um, uh, 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 the change hasn't been that dramatic in many of these places, and some of it has. Um, and here we see the decline in black-white segregation, yet its stubborn persistence. Um, uh, Black Americans make up, as, as I've said, around 12 to 13% of the population, but they overwhelmingly live around white people. Um, and uh, this uh, experience of segregation is often tied to experiences of concentrated poverty, which create a range of issues um, for black communities and within black communities. And so the decline of this segregation is a good sign. Um, uh, if we believe in, say, something like diversity of communities and the distribution of opportunities, but we should be cautious about how successful this transformation has been, because while it has fallen, if you look, for example, at one of the second most segregated cities, New York City here, you'll notice that New York City's levels of segregation between 1980 and today are effectively unchanged. Nothing really has changed in New York in terms of its level of segregation over the last 30 years. Um, while racial segregation has started to decline um, slightly, class segregation or economic segregation, segregation by income has, been, has started to rise. So there is increasing levels of segregation among people by economic position. 
rich people are more likely increasingly to live surrounded by other rich people. Poor people are more likely increasingly to live surrounded by other poor people. And this is generating experiences of concentrated advantage and concentrated disadvantage. There are some neighborhoods that have high degrees of concentration of advantage in them. And there are other neighborhoods that have high degrees of concentration of disadvantage. If we think back to previous lectures that I've given about you know, social class, for example, what this helps us see is how it is that class might be reproduced. So what conflict theorists thought of as the constant reproduction of class positions within a society and how that happens through education, we can see some of that happening through neighborhoods. Some young people in America grow up in neighborhoods with huge amounts of resources available to them in their neighborhood context. There's just lots of things there, from cultural organizations to incredible schools to money flowing through to having social ties to lots of people who might provide other, other opportunities for them. Other young people grow up in neighborhoods of extreme disadvantage and extreme concentration of disadvantage. And this um, should lead us to see some of the ways in which inequality is reproduced because insofar as income segregation has become increasingly common within cities, what we're observing is not just the production of inequality through the means of what people are doing, a transformation in the economy, we're seeing the reproduction of, of, of inequality happening through space and how spatial or living dynamics are creating advantages for some and disadvantages for others. Now, we kind of can't, can't talk about the experience of urban um, life in the United States without thinking about violence. Um, and um, cities and violence and the discussions of cities and violence kind of go hand in hand um, in many of our uh, um, popular discourse. But I want you to know, um, and this is very important, that um, uh, uh, urban violence has declined enormously in the United States. If you listen to the political rhetoric, you know, politicians rail on again and again and again about being tough on crime, tough on crime, you know, increases in crime. There has been a massive, massive decrease in crime in the United States, um, and in particular in cities. Um, the U.S. is still a fairly violent country, and in future lectures, I'll talk about crime, deviance, and violence, and what explains um, um, uh, that and, and, and how to make sense of some of this crime decline. So um, look to those lectures if you're really interested in this phenomenon. I'm going to do a deeper dive there. Um, but despite the increase in concentrated poverty, more people living in concentrated poor neighborhoods, and continued segregation, both racial and um, income segregation, crime has fallen sharply since the early 19. So crime peaked basically in the early 90s and more recently is, basic, is where it was basically going back to the late 1950s. So violent crime is at a historic low in the United States. It's important for me to repeat that because um, if you live in the U.S. or you live outside of the U.S., there's so much about violent crime in the United States. And I want to know that violent crime is at a historic low in the United States. Um, and um, it's not that there's nothing to be concerned about. In 2015, there was an increase in the national homicide rate, which may, made some people deeply concerned. You can see that on this graph, at the very tail end of the graph here. You can see um, this little peak um, of uh, the homicide rate going up, which made people really concerned, although it's gone down. There's a lot of discussion right now in 2020 about what's happening with the homicide rate um, related to COVID and the economic downturn, um, that maybe there's going to be an increase in violent crime um, this year. In certain cities, it seems like there probably will be. Again, that's cause for concern. But just to repeat, it's nothing like what it was. 
um, and um, uh, uh, this decrease in violent crime in the United States is incredibly important for us to acknowledge and recognize. Now, what caused this decrease in um, violent crime? Well, um, you're gonna have to jump ahead to lectures on um, violence uh, and uh, crime, criminology and violence. Um, um, and so uh, I'll explain, um, drawing upon the work of others, I don't do this work myself, um, what it is that might explain this massive decrease in urban violence. Um, and we, I have to say that it's particularly interesting that this has happened under conditions where there's an increase in concentrated poverty, continuation of racial segregation, an increase in economic segregation. And even with those sets of things, which we would think might increase violent crime, we haven't seen increases in violent crime. I'll also just note here, what this graph shows is from 1960 to 2018, the homicide rate. Uh, criminologists and sociologists almost always look at the homicide rate as kind of the most important rate for explaining violent crime um, because homicides are all reported. It is incredibly rare to have a homicide that doesn't get categorized, counted, or observed. Other kinds of crime are actually really difficult to observe given crime statistics because of reporting rates. Sexual assault is a very good example of this. Reporting rates are very low for sexual assault. And so we don't see very high rates of reporting for sexual uh, assault. And to provide you with national statistics could be kind of meaningless. Homicides, though, are almost all, you know, 99.99% of them get reported and categorized as such. And so they, are, they tend to be the indicator we look at when trying to explain the violence. So I want to end this series of lectures in urban sociology about the future of urban life and to ask, you know, where are we going with um, urban life? What, what is urban life going to look like over the next century? Um, and here, there's a lot of things that we haven't quite touched on that are deeply important to cities and important to the future life of cities. Cities are seen as many, by many, as the key to economic growth and environmental sustainability, but they're also sites of extreme um, inequality. Here we have um, a slum in Xiamen, China, um, and uh, you can see the buildings in the distance where likely quite wealthy people are living, and here a slum, um, uh, people living alongside this water where likely not terribly poor, but relatively poor people are living. Um, and, uh, you know, cities are places that are going to be deeply impacted by the coming environmental crisis. Um, and uh, um, you may note there that I have predicted the coming of an environmental crisis. It's almost certainly going to be the case that there will be a massive environmental crisis um, uh, coming and that people living in cities are going to potentially, you know, disproportionately experience this in part because so many people are living in cities. But cities are often located on water near oceans and things like flooding and environmental catastrophe are going to affect those cities. But cities are also seen as part of the environmental solution that people living in densely clustered areas together use fewer resources. They're not driving around in their cars in order to get food to them it's highly efficient, right? If you have to drive every piece of groceries, you know, 10 miles to get to the next family, it's really environmentally inefficient. Cities are far more environmentally efficient than other kinds of places. And so some view cities, the future of cities, as the future of our environmental sustainability, that this is how we will meet environmental sustainability goals. Cities are also the primary place of economic growth. Um, they may be the home of inequality, but huge amounts of economic growth happen in cities. But insofar as that growth is happening in cities and people are migrating there, they're also sites of extreme inequality and sites of some of the worst poverty, particularly in developing countries. 
If we look at this picture, um, you know, one of the things that you would be concerned about when looking at this picture is the environmental conditions of this slum. And by environmental conditions, I mean, do people have access to clean water? Um, uh, what does the sewage system look like here? What are the consequences of that? People here may be getting pretty sick from living in this space because of a lack of access to clean potable water, because of a lack of access um, uh, uh, to sanitation, et cetera. And so slums, particularly in developing countries, um, this is more so the case in India and Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and um, uh, 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 we see challenges in Indonesia, these, spaces that people are living in um, may be causing them, likely causing them um, early death because of exposure to all kinds of problems of living in the cities. And so seeing cities as some ways the future of um, uh, 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 the world being environmentally sustainable, the location of economic growth, um, also, you know, that half of the world now lives in cities and more and more people are migrating to them. They really are the future of social life. But there are a serious set of social problems from concentrated poverty to segregation um, that make cities, uh, for some, untenable. And so how to take advantage of the opportunities that cities provide while helping moderate some of the disadvantages will be the fundamental task of um, the future. And um, uh, the questions that we need to ask ourselves, that you need to ask yourself as a student and as somebody who's going to live longer than I am in all likelihood and be somebody influencing urban um, life, social policy, and a member of a community, is how to create just, innovative, creative cities that can be inclusive. And here we see a picture of a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, where a diverse group of people are gathering together to talk about the importance of black lives um, and to ask how it is that cities and policing in cities could be more inclusive, more just than it currently is. And so we should ask what are the ways in which we can create greater sustainability, greater public health, greater social inclusion, while still having economic growth within these spaces. I'll say that a current important element of this is the question of public health, of what it means to think about health as a community collectively, rather than just um, the individual health of different members of the city. And you'll see me addressing in future lectures some of these questions in economic sociology about what future economic growth in cities might look like in health wellness um, lectures and illness lectures about what public health approaches to life in cities might look like, um, and in the crime lectures and in deviance lectures, thinking through why it is that crime and deviance happen in cities and what we can do about them. And then finally, in the environment lectures, to ask how is it that cities can be spaces of environmental sustainability and how is it that we can address some of the environmental and public health concerns of concentrated poverty within places like slums of particular cities? So those will be questions that we take up. And insofar as um, human communities have been fundamentally transformed in light of population growth, and that much of this is happening in cities, many of the questions that we ask in sociology across a range of, um, of areas deal in some way or another with urban life. And so we'll hear more and more about this in many of the other lectures to come.